is pleased to present Senator Mike Gravel, known throughout the world as being an independent perspective in a time when many Me Too voices are only heard, author of The Kingmaker's Odyssey and Citizen Power. Senator Gravel has spent a career recognizing the importance of not just doing what is facile or easy. The voice of conscience in matters such as the current war and other important topics for which each of us have reaped the benefit. Live at Robbins is pleased and honored to present Senator Mike Gravel. Do I have to stand here for the uh, camera or whatever? I can stand out there. Or, okay, good. I like the familiarity of moving around. Okay, good. Just unwind it. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> One, I'm particularly honored to come here to a very famous bookstore. <laughs> yeah, I love bookstores. Uh, the uh, and when I travel around and I've got loose time, you know, I'll find a second-hand bookstore that I can go in and just rummage around. And I've picked up some wonderful deals. Uh, on one shelf, I picked up all the writings in one series of, uh, uh, of who else, but uh, uh, got a senior moment already, uh, the author of Common Sense, uh, Tom Paine. Tom and for seventy-five hours, if you don't think that was in the find, and I picked up uh, others, uh, the the five volumes. They're all little itty bitty volumes of uh, John Marshall's biography of of uh, George Washington, and that that's the reward of getting around, just snooping around, and picking up uh, uh, into bookstores. But <clears throat> that's my personal pleasures. But let me just talk a little bit about the books that I have out there right now. And I say books in plural because it's a bit of a, uh, an unusual situation, uh, particularly in my case. Uh, I'm not that knowledgeable. The last I published uh, in my career, uh, the first book I published uh, and written was a, a book called Jobs and More Jobs in Alaska. And I set up the publication house to do it. We called it uh, Mount McKinley Press. And it was a polemic. It was to try to put out the views I held at the time in Alaska. And, uh, and the title of it says it all, Jobs and More Jobs. And of course, Alaska had a very, very high rate of, rate of unemployment. In some parts of Alaska, it was 50% unemployed. That was really in the old days. And so I really made a pledge in seeking public office that I would bring about uh, a solution to the unemployment problem. Well, of course I did. I brought about the Alaska Pipeline, and that did solve the uh, employment problem of Alaska. And it solved a few other national problems, including an energy problem and an environmental problem, because that was the environmental solution as I viewed it at that particular point in time. But subsequent to that, I get got involved with the Pentagon Papers, releasing the Pentagon Papers, and when the media uh, would not continue to publish the papers because they were at risk as a result of, of a Supreme Court decision, I canvassed all of the publication houses in the United States. Nobody would touch it with a 10-foot pole except one, which was Beacon Press, which was the same corporate entity as the Unitarian Universalist Association. And they had received a, uh, a donation uh, anonymously to, uh, to print the Pentagon Papers. And so they printed it, and they honored me by calling it the Senator Gravel edition of the Pentagon Papers. And for, the, for the doing that, they were harassed unbelievably by the federal government, and uh, they brought uh, myself and Dr. Rothberg, who was the editor, and they, that case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, up to a point, I was safe as a senator. But when I went out and published with Beacon Press, then we were all at risk. And so the Supreme Court ruled 5-4 that, uh, that as long as I was publishing within the Senate, I was safe. 
but the minute I went out, then we weren't safe. So technically, uh, Richard Nixon could have indicted me, uh, the Unitarian uh, Organization, and Dr. Rotberg. But at that point, when the court case came out, uh, the Watergate had just been exposed. Just the tip of it had been exposed, not the full part of it, because that was in June of 72 that the Supreme Court rendered their decision uh, in that regard. And uh, so they left it alone, and plus he had uh, McGovern on the ropes, and they, he, he really had it in the bag. So they left us alone. But it, the irony of it was that the the triumvirate that they had set up the year before, the plumbers were formed as a result of uh, Ellsberg's leak of the, pa given the giving the papers to me, and right after I released the papers in the Senate, that's when the plumbers were formed. And the first act, the criminal act they did was to go ahead and break into Ellsberg's psychi psychiatrist's office in Los Angeles, and that's what caused the court to throw out the case against Ellsberg and Russo in California. And of course, in my case in Boston, the grand jury was impaneled and Judge Garrity uh, rendered a decision, moved it, got rid of the hot potato real quick, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. The decision of the Supreme Court was momentous because what they said was that a senator or any member of Congress could release any secret from any administration and could not be touched. Now, the tragedy is that nobody's released any secrets since since the Pentagon Papers. That's the tragedy. I was with the Congressman Jim Moran, uh, and I went to hear him speak because I somebody had uh, clued me in and said that they, he had made a statement that he had some special information that George Bush was going to attack Iran. And so I went out of my way to go hear him speak, and, and he's my congressman in Virginia. I live in Arlington. And, uh, and, I, and I caught him outside. I said, Jim, I, I heard this, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, look, it, you can release this. And in my court case, and don't trust me, I'm not an attorney, call uh, Professor Tigar at American University, and he'll back up uh, this statement that uh, you're free as a bird. You can release whatever you want, and nobody's gonna, nobody can touch you. Well, and I says, contact me or have somebody in your staff contact me and I'll get you the details of the case or contact. Please come on, sit down. There's a couple of seats. Make yourself comfortable. There's two more and I'm sure they can haul out some more chairs later. There's, there's one there and there's a couple there. So he uh, turned around and, uh, uh, and so I told him, and I says, and, if, and if, that's, if that bothers you, I'll meet you in an elevator. You, you can drop some papers on the floor and you can leave and I'll pick them up and I don't know where I got them, and, uh, and I'll do what the hell I want with them. I could care less. There's nobody going to touch me at my age that's going to make a difference. And so it was left there, and I said, well, he says, well, what, you know, you can get it from Cy Hirsch. Well, I know Cy Hirsch, and, uh, and I know what Cy Hirsch knows, and so he doesn't know much more than I know, so I don't have any smoking gun, and if I had a smoking gun, I'd just get it out there as fast as I could. So I had the same suspicions as he has about George Bush, and the lady was making reference uh, about the world can't wait. Uh, and uh, all I can, the added intelligence, I was going to say, I'll tell you, knew something about that. Sarkozy, uh, one of the things when you've been there, you sort of can read between the lines and the moves. Sarkozy, uh, President of France, was patting George Bush on the back about it. You know, you're leaving, you're a great, you're a great leader. Uh, talk about being able to jerk, can't even recognize a jerk. The, so, he's, and George Bush says, oh, I'm not gone yet. I still got things to do. My God, I heard that statement and I said, oh my God, don't, don't tell me he's really going to do it. And the only thing he could possibly do would be to, if, to give a fait accompli of uh, invading Iran. Well, there's another encouraging thing. Uh, if you want to read between the lines, is that when Gates fired these two top guys at the Air Force, I don't care what, what reasons he gave, but it was the Air Force that was the ones that were agitating to go drop some bombs in Iran, uh, on Iran. And so that he got rid of these two top guys. The minute I saw that, it, it really, I felt good that maybe there, there's a little sanity because the, Gates has been a very measured voice in this, if you read between the lines. He, 
But then, you know, trying to keep keep uh, Dick Cheney and George Bush in a cage is very difficult. Uh, and so he's got his work cut out for himself. So let, let's cross our fingers. But, you know, Cheney was running around the Middle East ginning up uh, the possibility of invading her. It doesn't get any more insane than that. I'll get back to the books in a moment. But the, the, this is the, the biggest problem we face is Iran is the key to uh, Iraq. It's the key to peace in the Middle East. It's the key to the mess we have in Central Asia. We just don't realize it. And so in our stupidity to think that we want to take Iran and make that the cause of another war it is just unbelievable. And that's, of course, and of course, I, you know, I, I don't have to start quoting Obama or the others. Uh, they don't understand that either. That, uh, oh, they talk about one way they talk about it, but if you heard the statement made at the APEC uh, conference, where uh, Obama essentially said, and of course this is not, this is at variance from what he said before. When I charged Hillary, which was of course why they cut me out shortly thereafter with General Electric and uh, Howard Dean uh, in the debates, was when I charged the Democratic Party with setting up the war to, for Bush to be able to invade Iran, uh, and, and Obama wasn't even there to vote. And then when he spoke to AIPAC, we said, well, obviously, he would have voted for this same thing. So uh, it w it before he was criticizing Hillary for her vote, and then all of a sudden he now turned tail and joined and, and drank from the same bottle of Kool-Aid as all the others were drinking from. It, the, the, we're, we're on sad times at, at this point in our juncture. Cross your fingers if we can get through. There's a few scenarios that uh, we can try to, and it's not just me, I just spent the weekend with Ramsey Clark and. Uh, in, in Oakland, in California, and uh, he has the same view that I have, and that is that, boy, we're just holding our breath and don't know what to do. It just got to be, the world's got to be lucky. If we were to do some crazy thing like this, in the minimum, it means a world depression. In the maximum, it could mean a nuclear exchange. Uh, I would equate it, uh, I, being a history buff, I always try to measure things by comparison. It could equate uh, the situation that existed with the uh, when the Ancien regime exploded in the uh, in August of 1914, when the, the arrogance, the stupid arrogance of the world leaders thought that they could have a short, quick war when they destroyed the world that they knew, and uh, and caused the carnage that set the whole world up uh, for the Second World War, and then set it up for the Cold War. And the whole century was a disaster that started from the arrogance of uh, these crazy leaders. And so now we're moving into the 21st century, and we seem to be beset by the same thing. And it's our country that's at the heart of it all with American imperialism. But uh, I can come back with Q&As on that. I don't want to, but I just want to talk about the three books that we have. The, the, the book that we have, and it, that shows you how how unaccustomed I am to being, to publicizing, uh, is I got all three books out. This was co-written over a two-year period by Joe Lauria and myself. Joe is a newspaper man, a, 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 a reporter, works out of the UN in New York. Uh, he writes for the London Times. He used to write for the Boston Globe. He really is a, an independent stringer because he doesn't trust working for uh, big organizations, and uh, and I applaud him for that. So that means he's always a day late and a dollar short and needing money. And so he's on assignment uh, tonight as we speak, uh, going out to <clears throat> the countryside in Virginia, talking to a former CIA official uh, to try to get uh, some information of stuff that's just been s slipped out over uh, the con uh, distribution of nuclear uh, information, uh, particularly on some design of some warheads, and uh, and so he's on. A, he's doing the Lord's work. Let's put it that way. Uh, and so I told him that I was extending his apologies for not being here. He's a wonderful guy. He's a good writer. Uh, what you see is his style uh, in here. And his style is much better than I. I write for clarity. He he he's, he writes for a living, 
and uh, and so if there's any chance we have of having a bestseller, it's going to be this book. And I need a bestseller. That's uh, I'm, gonna, I'm broke. That's <laughs> just uh, just that simple. The other book that's here, where did it go? Uh, did we not have it? Oh yeah, I got it. I got it here. And this is a book, uh, and this is the um, Kingmakers. And this is a book that is, again, co-wrote. Uh, and the publish publishing house is uh, Phoenix Books. This is Seven Story Press. Uh, Seven Story is known, you know, they publish Howard Zinn and Kurt Vonnegut and people like that. Uh, Kingmakers uh, is out of Beverly Hills. The fellow who is the one of the owners is a friend of mine going back 40 years, uh, Michael Viner. And uh, the, only th the only thing I'm angry about this book is when I co-write something with somebody, meaning that uh, they do the writing work, you'll notice that Joe Loria's name is the same size as my name. And I insisted on that because the first cut of this, you needed a magnifying glass to see Joe Loria's name. And he did the writing. And so I insisted that it was a deal breaker if his name wasn't the same size as my name. And, it, and it's, it's just fair. And uh, and you got and it's just fair, period. So I had the same requirement here that uh, you know his name's got to be the same size as my name. Well, they they said yes, and I said it's a deal breaker. If you don't have the same size, the deal's off. Okay. Well, uh, you got to get a watch. And so I did not see this thing before it went to press. And when I saw the final book version, and I saw this, I was madder than all hell. And so. Every time I'm now going to talk about it, I'm going to talk about the unfairness of it because David Eisenbach, who's a beautiful human being, professor at Columbia, he did more work on this book than I did. And uh, though he has spent a lot of time with me, worked in my campaign, knows my thoughts on it, we discussed this at great length, I had input on every single part of this book, it's, it's both our intellects measured together, but he did most of the writing. And so therefore he deserves to have his equal billing. And I know what they're doing. They're turning around and trying to use my cachet to help sell the book. Fine. But we're talking in this book about fairness and lack of, and not, not relying on celebrity. And that's what they're trying to do there is sell this on the basis of celebrity. Well, it's a little bit of hypocrisy and I don't want to buy into that. So I'll tell you, when they, when they, the next printing, which of course I wanted to have soft covers. I don't believe in hard covers. They cut too many trees when they do hard covers. So I wanted a soft cover. So the next printing is going to be a soft cover and you're going to, and you're going to see it. The name's going to be both the same size. So, but this is a good book. Don't uh, don't let me criticize the book. It's a great book. Because what we've put together uh, David and I is is analyzed and and it's awesome in this regard. In fact, I'm very proud of the fact that Publishers Weekly, when they did the review of the book, the last sentence of Publishers Weekly said, Amer every American should read this book. And it really is such that they should, because what it says is that why we went to war, why the failings of, of the media today. And it's not just the media. We have a failing of representative <coughs> government. We have a failing of the Congress. We have a failing of the executive. And, and so, uh, and if you're not familiar, Thomas Jefferson, who's not one of my favorites, but made a great statement. If you got a choice between the media and representative government, <coughs> he would go for the media. I would too. The media is just as important as the representatives in government. And, and, uh, and so when the government fails and the media fails, and that's what this point, this book points out, how the media has failed. We, to put the not too fine a point on it, we take names and we kick butt in this book. And, uh, and we, we arrive at some very interesting uh, conclusions, and that is, it's called citizen reportage, a citizen media. And that's what the internet is all about. And that's what the hope is, not mainline media, which is <coughs> controlled by the same forces that control our government, that is, the military industrial complex, and the financial interest of Wall Street uh, and, and all of that. And so that's what this book is about. It's a short book, it's a quick read, but it, it's got evidence, evidence over and over again about the details of it and how bad that we've been misled by the networks, by the New York Times, 
Washington Post, and a few others, but primarily those journals and how they play a game with the media and how they did it with with respect to the um, uh, to the manipulation of the news. Now the other now this one is is all mine. Uh, this is Citizen Power and it's self-published. I, I wrote first wrote Citizen Power and at the time this was in 1971. It came out in 1972. At the time, it was Citizen Power, a people's platform. And I was grappling with then, it was a polemic also, going through all of the issues that we faced. It was at the beginning of my Senate career. I had had the success of filibustering the draft. I stopped the nuclear testing in the North Pacific. I was able, I was working uh, worldwide on capping the number of nuclear power plants that could be built. And, and so I was very heady and very optimistic. At the end of my Senate career, that was not the case. I was disgusted, uh, and so when I when I was pressured by friends to, uh, you know, get a second edition out, uh, and then with the thought of running for president, uh, that, yeah, I probably should, and so lo and behold, I reread it, and I was horrified. Everything that I dealt with in the first uh, in 1971, everything got worse. Everything that we faced in the country has gotten worse as issues, whether it's education, whether it's crime and punishment, which was, of course, prison reform and, uh, and other issues, uh, uh, governance, what have you, all got worse. And so after I got shut out of the, uh, the debates in September, and all of this instead took place from uh, September to March, essentially all of these got came into fruition. So when I got shut out uh, of the debates then, and I was still a candidate, I was doing some minor appearances, but I was broke. And so I spent the time trying to bring all these things to fruition. I had two co-authors on this, and I had this one. And I had a little bit of help on a couple of chapters that was not new ideas, but stuff that people that had done a little bit of research. And I said, here, give me your draft. And that's the one on prison reform and one on the drug war, which I had written about extensively. But this one fellow, Michael Gray, did a much better job than I stuff. So I tweaked his stuff, but the rest of it is mine. But the thing that's most important in here is here is solution. And that's why I now call this one a mandate for change. And as you know, the campaign, everybody talks about change, change. They've done a focus group. And the focus group says, oh, people want change. Well, big deal, people want change. They wouldn't understand change if it hit them in the head with a two-by-four. And because the change they're talking about is polemic change. Oh, health care. That's not change. That's a change in policy. Uh, or uh, you name it, a foreign policy. That's a change in policy. What I'm talking about is structural change of representative government. And that change is bringing the people into the operation of government as lawmakers. And in, in chapter two and chapter two, and I've been at it for 10, took me 10 years to write this law called the National Initiative through, and, and I have 16 years of legislative experience. And, and that's there now for the people to vote for it, pass it into law. We need 60 million Americans. The Congress will never pass it. And I ran for president, and I've been outed on this. I ran for president to bring national attention on this concept of empowering the American people. There's only one place on earth that has this, and that's Switzerland. And in the United States, in 24 states, where we make laws at the state and local level. It's very imperfect at the state and local level because it's not a very deliberative process. And in Switzerland, it's somewhat cumbersome. They put it in place in 1848. And so I've been able to have the advantage of going to Switzerland, lecturing in Bern, and at the same time looking at their process and improving upon it, looking at the various states and improving upon that, and then taking 10 years vetting it, and then getting scholars to see if they could punch holes in it. And so we got what we got now is a process that I, I'm very, very proud of, and others have vetted it with me. And so now it's ready to be enacted into law, and all you got to do is go vote for it. The problem is, it's, it's, it's out of the box, and that, that's, that's what's difficult. But you can get it with this book. And I keep telling people, and I'll hope that uh, we, can, we can get this book carried here at the bookstore, 
Uh, and so that's that's my literary accomplishment for 2008. It's a it, it's a little bit slugs your motor a little bit when you get that much out at once. Uh, I'm no longer running for president. Uh, in my heart of hearts, I didn't want to be president. Oh, I like the perks, you know. But the, then again, that's the only thing I liked about the Senate were the perks that, and wielding some power. You know, power is great if you can do something with it, but if you're just going to enjoy the perks, forget it. And that's what's wrong with the, the system. You get you, you, you get used to the perks, and you'll do anything to hang on to the perks and not use the power. Because when you use the power, you put your power in jeopardy. And you've heard the cliche, oh, you better not put your, uh, use your power, you know, you'll, you'll use up your, what you have. Well, my God, I found that uh, when you've got power, if you use it, then you get more power. You don't, you don't lose it. You get it. And, uh, and I found that by being a maverick, because I may not have been the most popular guy in the Senate when I was there, but boy, I'll tell you, when, when I threatened to filibuster, uh, I got a lot more that happened as a result of that threat than not. And, uh, but it didn't make you popular. But you didn't get elected to be popular. You get elected to try to accomplish things. So let me close on that note and engage because, you know, I have filibuster. I go on for hours, but it, let's, let's have a, a, a dialogue rather than a monologue. So I'll open it up and then I'll close uh, quietly. Mm -hmm. And because I'm not running for president, don't think you get rid of me. I mean, I got some, I got some thread left on these tires, and I'm going to be an activist. And now that I got some visibility, I'm going to continue to try and keep the visibility up, and use the cachet and the visibility for causes that I believe in. And and so that that so it's very important to keep doing that. I didn't do that for a while. When I left the Senate, I was disgusted, but now. Uh, I want to see the change because I've landed on something with the National Initiative, and that's what I want to push. So, questions that you may want to pursue with me, please. Senator Gravel, I just wanted to mention that uh, you know, I, I came here because I thought your performance in the debate was stunning. Really, I, I was shocked. I thought you raised the level of political discourse considerably just through those brief moments that you had the opportunity to say something. Uh, so, I just wanted. Thank you very much uh, about some of the things that you said. Uh, I think uh, what you pointed to was trying to get us out of this culture of fear. I remember one of the loaded questions being directed at you was about our enemies and what should we do about our enemies. And you said we had no enemy. And it just like felt like a lead balloon in the, in the place. Everyone is so exacerbated. Everyone is so obsessed about this terror, terrorism stuff. Comments that you made about terrorism, I thought, raised the level of discourse on that issue. What would you say about this culture of fear that we have, and how can we get ourselves out of it? Well, I, you're, you're quite, you're right on. It, uh, we create our enemies. We create our enemies. We don't have enemies. Normal human beings, you know, we got good in us. We got bad in us, and uh, and it's and we have a tendency to want to bring out the good in us. Uh, and, and structures uh, help us or hurt us. And right now the structure in our leadership is hurting us and has because of the way we are structured in representative government. So with respect to fear, we've had the unfortunate situation when 9-11 struck that we had an idiot as president who, who called upon fear and vengeance when what we should have had was a president like FDR who at the time when we really had a problem, he called upon courage. You know, we got nothing to fear but fear itself. And courage is so important because, you see, that is the virtue that permits us to implement our other virtues. If you have no courage, all these other virtues go by the boards. And so, and we didn't have that. And then, but you see, it played into what they were all about. Uh, they, uh, they, they, they wanted the, the military-industrial complex controls our society, so they played right into that. So rather than call terror for what it is, a criminal act, it's a war. And so that permits us now, you've got to fear the terrorist. Uh, there's, there's an interesting phenomenon that was studied in the Second World War in London. As you know, 
they, they, most of the people who could afford to do it moved their children out of London during the Blitz and sent them to the rural areas. And so they were doing some surveys of how people handled the Blitz. They'd go down in the subway, sleep in the subways at night, and then get up in the morning and go to work. Uh, and, uh, and how they could handle that, the stress of it. And then they would do the sur surveys in the rural areas where they sent the kids. And guess what? The people who were really under the gun of the bombing, they handled it. They habituated to the threat. The people who lived in fear of the bombing were the people in the rural areas that weren't particularly threatened with the bombing. And it's, it's this problem of habituation. So here, we in the United States that don't have a threat of ha getting very much of hurt, 3,000 people are killed. We what, what 40,000 people a year die on the highways? Uh, there's just no way that, 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 that it warrants the level of threat that we have that warrants the 1984 drill that we go through at the airports the, and the, the usurpation of our, our rights and the, the cost to our economy of what we go through in preparation for the airports and all of that. But it's, it's, the war, it's the fear and the war terminology that's used, and so we now have the TSA and the amount of money that's spent. And, and, it, and you go to the airport and you see people subject themselves to this one uh, in an interesting fashion because they think it's giving them safety, that they're going to fly safely. Well, stop and think of the hours, the hours, and the cost of this on our economy. You don't, you don't go through this in Europe. You don't go through this in other countries. Uh, this is just the beginning of this whole process. So how to break the syndrome of fear? It's, it's all tied in to the control of the military industrial complex and the, and the control of our society by Wall Street to financial interest. And, uh, and there's no magic to that. Uh, they control it. Uh, Eisenhower warned it. This is a conscious decision made, at, made after the Second World War. We were seared by the experience of the Depression. Now, I was a child of the Depression. Uh, we, we were very, very modest. Uh, we, were, you know, we didn't know poverty because everybody was in the same boat. So I didn't know poverty. Uh, it, my parents, my, my dad at one point sold apples, big deal. He was an enterprising, hardworking guy, and he was always entrepreneurial. But, uh, and so we, we worked when we were kids. Uh, and he left me with a legacy of, uh, of pride in being a workaholic. And, and, and I didn't understand that when I was a kid. In fact, I understood it with the research that Joe Lauria did on me. Would you believe it? At my age, I finally understood what my father had done for me was make me a workaholic. I knew I was a workaholic, but the, he did it. And, and so, so in answer, we, we came off the Second World War we, we can't go back to a depression. We knew that the, the depression was solved by the Second World War, not by the New Deal. And lo and behold, we built up a government bureaucracy. And there's no agent of greater oppression than government. And, and so now, but we've got to deal with that. And you wonder, well, you know, when I left the Democratic Party, I tried to be a libertarian so I could run for president. You know, I've got no problem with being a libertarian. I am a libertarian. What do you think I was? I was a maverick misfit as a Democrat. The Democratic Party is a war party, just like the Republican Party is a war party. I, I've got no space for war. And yet, I enlisted in the Korean War. I have no problem of going to war uh, if, if, if I'm threatened. Uh, believe it or not, I, I'm a pacifist, but I have no problem taking another person's life if he's to take my life or the... the Remember, Dukakis was asked if if this person uh, raped and killed your wife or something like that. What would you do? He was very thoughtful. You know, what my answer is I'd kill the SOB. Just that simple. I'm a passionate person, and so that. But thank God that there's laws that would not permit me to do that. And that's what we are. We're a civilization, a civilization with laws, and we need to have that to stop people from reacting adversely. And so the, it, these are things to, uh, to be handled. And so what we did is we created a warfare state, started with Harry Truman in 1947. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who had a sensitivity at the end of his term, he tried to get a handle on it himself. 
And what he did is he ginned up the nuclear aspect to get defense on the cheap. And of course we had the crazy guy, John Foster Dulles, who was the linchpin of going into Vietnam. And uh, there's a, a book by Gareth Porter, the uh, name escapes me, but uh, it was a friend of mine uh, who wrote a book who really identified, and for me, who really was the one. He's the guy that scotched the elections that would have taken place in Vietnam after the Geneva, the Paris Conference. Uh, and, but, but Eisenhower got his handle on it, and he warned us that democracy would, is threatened by the union of the contractors, the defense contractors, and the military. And you see the revolving door, and you see it in the media. It was just exposed. These generals and colonels go on TV, they're paid to give you the word about what's going on, and then they're paid by the defense contractors in the other pocket. It's just a sick situation, that, and that's what we're getting, and that's what we're getting. And Eisenhower warned of, warned us, it's a fact. It's a fact. No, the warning is no longer applicable. They own our government lock, stock, and barrel. You look at, uh, if you remember in the debates, I kept saying, follow the money. You know, I didn't have enough time to give you a big dissertation about analyzing how the money gets there and where's, how it's used. Just follow the money. You think that you can raise $250 million and not be owned by the people who put that money up? You think it comes from kids? I can tell you, it comes from up here, who then you use the money to gin up a few kids to 68% of Obama's money came from $500 and above. Kids don't donate $500. I got some kid money, it's not $500, I'll tell you. So speaking of that, do you think the web groups can really offer a genuine challenge to the legislature and aid APAC? Say it again, who? Do you think web groups? Web initiatives can really offer a strong enough challenge to the corruption of the legislature and uh, lobbies like APAC. Web web roots. Yeah, like you know, just web-based initiatives. No, no, it's it's the beginning. We're at the infancy of that whole area, and I mean infancy. We we don't really know its full impact. I'll give you an example. I'm fairly knowledgeable about the body politic. Been, been in it since I'm 50, 15 years old, I'm 78 years old. And, uh, and so I consider myself a little bit of an authority in politics, a little an authority somewhat in governance, and, uh, and I gotta tell you, when it comes to communication, I fancy I know a little bit. The internet, I was made a star in the internet, I had nothing to do with it. It was all done by kids. It was all done by kids. The rock in the water, there's a couple of high school teachers, 24 years old, they figured it all out. I did exactly what they told me to do, and, and I had to figure out what they were, after the fact, when the networks were calling me, because they were saying, what's this all about? And before I responded, and I wasn't gonna call the kids and say, what's this all about? I mean, I'm, I'm the senator after all, I can't ask them what's this all about. I had to sit and think for a minute, this is a metaphor. And I was flattered, it's a metaphor about life. It applies to everybody in the world. You, you focus on your life, and that's what me looking in the camera like an idiot, and, and, and focus on your life, and then go pick up a rock and throw it, and that make, causes ripples. And the ripples, then you go off and, to your demise. If that's not what our life is all about, I don't know what is. And two 24-year-old kids who teach in high school art and, and technology. And, and when they first came to me, they came through a, a young lady who was my campaign manager in Southern California who had been a star, who was a starlet. And, and she went to a guy who really thought he knew all about our campaign and he was always gonna give him 15 minutes uh, to come and film me. And she knew that that wasn't gonna cut it. So she contacted me directly. She says, these kids wanna film you. And I said, what about? What do they want you to throw a rock in the water? I said, they can have as much time as they want. They drove up from, from Los Angeles to San Francisco with, a, with some rocks in the, in the back of their trunk and scouted out a location and they did three or four other things and they did this and I did it and I had a whole bunch of problems that day and I just did like a robot what they told me to do. And it was just funny and the only pay they got was my daughter was with me and she bought some sandwiches during the take. 
and this thing got over 400,000 hits on the internet. And the only thing that beat that was, of course, my dancing with the Obama girl. <laughs> yeah. and, and I've only got one uh, two or three criteria. I'll do anything in this area as long as it's dignified, funny, and issue orientated. Any one of those three. And with the Obama girl, it was dignified and funny. And I enjoyed it. And she and uh, Amber was very professional. And, uh, and it added to my visibility. And that visibility permits me now to, to use my cachet on causes. Please, sir. Uh, I'm interested in hearing more about the, uh, the, the citizen empowerment end of your discussion. Jefferson talked about his notion of January 6th. Uh, and that part of his death to give the uh, Lord representative would be more closely tied to their views. If uh, there were other initiatives to try to get other parties established, there are a lot of citizen groups, people, I know several people here in the audience, who are part of various groups trying to get an impact, getting attention to what kind of issues we're concerned about in the public, and, and, through, and through the media to the larger public. What kind of, kind of initiatives are you talking about? And to follow up the earlier question, so wait a second. Your, your question is as good as a question as I've ever heard. And, and I don't know how many people have heard the question. Uh, stand up and, or I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll either way, I'll, I'll be happy to hear what, you, what you've heard and synthesize Okay. It. Well, I'll try to synthesize it. What, what he's putting together is uh, the analysis at one point in his later life that uh, Thomas Jefferson did uh, about... Uh, breaking down the participation of citizens by wards. Uh, the name, it, the word technology, it, it escapes me. I, I'm well read on it, I'm just forgetting the details of it. You and I both. <laughs> well, uh, but uh, let me just say one thing about Thomas Jefferson. He's not my favorite. He's, he's one of the most precocious writers. But is, as a politician, I found him to be a hypocrite. As a governor, he was lousy. As a president, he was really lousy. Uh, and he, but he was a great writer. And uh, he got and us he, Louisiana. He got us a lot of other territory. Pardon me. He got us a lot of, a lot of extra territory. No, he didn't do that. That Napoleon did that. Yeah, and the guy who really did it was Toussaint Louverture down in Haiti. down in uh, Haiti. Uh, get, let's let's give credit where credit is due. Poor little Toussaint who died in the dungeon is the one that did it. <laughs> the, uh, so. So no, it uh, I'm the, I'm the and malaria. Uh, get a, get a, the bug. The bug in Tucson did it. God, I'll tell you, uh, the uh, he didn't. Uh, Jefferson didn't even know what what was going on. Uh, and and what angers me so much was that that he gave intelligence that that uh, he had a hand in giving intelligence to the French to overcome the slavery revolt down in Haiti. That that's what pisses me off in that one. But but that but I but I do admire uh, him for being a writer and a thinker that that uh, that he didn't that he had he didn't have these other virtues he was well endowed but so that's not but but then he went on to add and that was an interesting facet of this he went on to add other facets of uh, of efforts at at citizen participation there's a line that you have to and this is really what you're driving at. The, the difference is, and let me jump ahead to an experience that, that we all probably would remember. Remember in 1982, the nuclear freeze movement? This is an interesting phenomena that occurred. This was a, a, like, a, like a, 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 a bolt of lightning out of the blue. 18 months. The largest number of votes on any one issue in all of American history at the city council level, at the state level. It passed the House of Representatives unanimously. Uh, there was nothing like it. It was a phenomenon that started in Massachusetts. And, uh, and it just went around the country. And what it was, it was misunderstood by many people, but what it was was, a, uh, it was to have a freeze on nuclear devices in the United States and in the Soviet Union. Now, many areas, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll sit down a little bit. It's been a long day. 
And so, and, and you all see me, uh, the, uh, okay, I'll stand up. Uh, and so, so what happened, uh, it, uh, the, the, it turned around and uh, Ronald Reagan was president, the nuclear freeze got to him, put it in the drawer, that was the end of it. What was wrong with that picture? It wasn't a law. It was nothing but a glorified poll, is really what it was. And a whole generation of people worked their hearts out, and then when it went nowhere, they became cynics. And, uh, and that's the danger that happens. When you raise people's expectations and nothing happens from it, they become cynics. That nothing's going to change in society. And so now, if you're going to define and use, try to use the word participation, there are a lot of things that people come up with. You know, let's have campaign finance reform. Well, on that one, don't hold your breath. You know, it's never going to, you're asking the foxes to redesign the chicken coop. They'll never do it. They're the ones that get the money. And so I've been involved with three reforms. And every time you do a reform, it gets worse, more convoluted, more involved. It's a joke, truly a joke. And, uh, and if you want, I can go into what Obama did at the beginning of the year in passing this deal. We're going to reveal who are the bundlers. And I'll tell you what really happened on that one. But, but so you've got to look at the, there, there's a lot of beneficial things that can be done, but they're minuscule in their effect on what will happen in improvements. Now, I don't mean to say that there's not some improvements that are made. Yes, there are. But you have to go back to some very interesting observations and say, why is it that most of the nations in the world, what we call democracies, they're not, they're representative government, why is it that they copied our Constitution? Because our Constitution leaves in place the elites of that society. And so, who copies it? The elites? And it's a great vehicle for the elites to stay in power. Now, there's only one, there's only one country that has, and that doesn't mean you can't have good, uh, good governments. Sweden, Norway, the Scandinavian countries are emblematic of, of great societies. But, but it's only Switzerland that really brought about a great advance. And that was when they brought the people in in 1848 after a three-year religious civil war. Now, Switzerland had four languages, four cultures, four religions, uh, no resources. Alex de Tupville at the time said, this will never work in Switzerland. And uh, lo and behold, a hundred and, what, 60 years later, they have, uh, they lived in peace, and uh, they turn around, and they are one of the most prosperous nations in the world. Uh, and have more freedom than almost anybody in the world. And what do they have that no other nation has? They have the people operating in partnership, making laws with their elected officials. Now, it's a very convoluted, it evolved process. And so in studying that, and then in, at the turn of the century, which copied the Swiss, in 24 states, they brought about lawmaking at the state and local level. And the studies show that in the states that have lawmaking, uh, at that level, they have better government, better results, which is what the same thing that they did when they had studies of the town meeting uh, communities had better results than the charter communities in the colonial periods. So what, what I glean from that is that it's got to be lawmaking. You've got to go to the fundamentals and say, and this is where Nader picked up and was quoted in the forward of my book, Citizen Power, and that is the definition of Cicero of, of freedom. Freedom is participation in power. We Americans are so arrogant, we think we we got a lot of freedom here. We don't have any freedom here. We don't participate in power. We give our power away on election day. And so we listen to all the media and everybody tell us how powerful we are. We don't. You gave it away. You gotta wait four years. Why do you think that people don't get excited over all these terrible crimes that Bush has done. You can't do anything about it. The Congress isn't doing anything about it. The media is not doing anything about it. So you got to wait until election day, and then for a few seconds, you're going to throw a lever, and, and then they've spoon-fed to you what your choices are, the lesser of evils, and their, and their own lock and stock and barrel by those who have been owning it forever. And so you begin to see the shortcoming. So the answer is, you have to take the page from what he defined. What is, what is power 
in a democracy? It's lawmaking. It's, it's lawmaking, not voting, because whoever makes the laws, and you saw that in Florida, you saw that in Ohio, whoever makes the laws determines who votes and how you vote and what are the hours you vote in and, and whether you're going to have enough ballots to, to vote on, which you saw didn't happen in Ohio. So, and, and you know what your choices are? Obey the law or go to jail. And I can give you uh, examples of people who go to jail who are innocent. You know that as well as I do. And so it's, you've got to become lawmakers. Now, so when a person comes up and says, here, we've got to have the American people become law. Well, that's out of the box. You think, a, you think anybody in Congress understands when I say the American people have got to become lawmakers? I've got to tell you, I have not found anybody in Congress that understands that. I've, Kucinich has heard me talk about this. He doesn't understand it. Other members of Congress have heard me talk about it. They don't understand it. Why is it their minds can't understand that? I can tell you why. Real simple. I go run for office. I get money from a special interest. I then use that money to manipulate my constituency. I get elected. You think when I get elected that night, when everybody's applauding me, that I think they're smarter than I am? I'm the smart one. I just manipulated the hell out of you people. I told you what you wanted to hear to vote for me. You think, I think you're smarter than me? Of course not. There's not a member of Congress that thinks that the people are smarter than they are. They're not. And that's, that's the problem. And so, so now you go to the people and say, you're smarter than your leaders. They have a tough time. Exp well, there's a few gaggle of people, you know, Barney Frank and others, they're very, very smart. But they're, they're stuck in the mud, like the rest of us. When I was there, you're in the mud. You pick up, your, your, you're a tar baby is what you are when you're in the Congress. And you're walking around trying to get out of the tar. And so the only answer is to empower the American people to become lawmakers. Now, I've got no magic. I'm not making you, I'm not changing human nature. I'm just turning around and putting power into your hands. And you know something? We live in civic adolescence. And how do you grow up? How do, you, how do your parents, how do you give your children responsibility, responsibility, and then you hope when you're an adult you get the hell out of the house. <laughs> and so, and then they come back sometimes. So that's the answer, power, become a lawmaker. And all I can tell you is there's not enough hours, I'll bore you to death, is all I'm going to ask you to do is, and, and if, is to buy this book, I'll sell it to you, and if you can't afford it, I'll give it to you. Be and it's uh, true. I, I tell students when I go to university, if you don't have the $20 for this book, I'll give it to you. Send me the check. Some send, some don't. I don't care. I'm in the knowledge business. If I haven't proven anything with three books in one year, four books, is I'm in the knowledge business. And this is what floats my boat. Please. Well, I'm just, just to say, uh, I've been involved in a small way where I live in South Jersey. Getting first one ordinance and then perhaps three more in Valentine. Uh, louder, it's louder. We circulated, we circulated positions, I live in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, we circulated positions, about 30 or 40 people went around the township in very public and, and along the streets, door to door, getting people to sign positions to change the way politicians are elected, the way they, and now the way they can uh, do business with various contractors. And they're getting closer and closer on the second round to getting enough signatures to put it on the ballot in November again. The last time we got enough signatures, the township reversed itself and said they don't have to study it anymore. It's not too complicated. It's hard to do. They adopted it before we put it on the ballot. Uh, but I don't, I don't, I suspect that there are a lot of people who are willing to put in the time that it takes to learn about what's going on. You're talking about adolescents. And I, I suspect they're not even in adolescence but in infancy. We don't, we don't want to put the time in to find out what's going on, to take a position, to listen to other people, and then to try to work it through. A lot of people I've talked to over the years are happy to have someone else do the work for them. They suppose that those other people, sometimes they think people are corrupt, dishonest, but they don't want to do the work. They're, they're simply not prepared to involve themselves. And you, you see how uninformed Americans are about their own history, let me let me respond to that. Let me respond to that. First off, does the name Lloyd uh, Wells mean anything to you? No, I'm sorry. 
Okay, okay he's, he's from Cherry Hill. He lives up in Maine right now. He sent me what you're talking about, what's going on in Cherry Hill right now. I glanced at it real quick. I get I get more more stuff about Cherry Hill than I care to care to have. Believe me. <laughs> but but he's but he's he's committed because he was a long time resident. He's in his late 80s, uh, and so. But no, you're wrong. With all due respect. No no, you're all due respect. You're wrong. Here's here's what happens. Uh, you don't have to vote on everything. You don't have to be informed on everything. And there's nothing wrong with somebody letting somebody row for a while. You know, you're in a boat. You know, I'm not in it. Here, but it, it's no different in representative government. I was a senator from Alaska. Do you think I ever read a farm bill? Hell no. I had no interest in farm legislation. I either rolled over on the bill, I, whatever I did. Uh, you know, I, I voted if I was in town to keep my record up. And I didn't have a great record on voting because I was so bored many times. But, uh, but, but so th that, that's not a good, that's not a valid answer. The, what it is is people will vote if they have an interest in something. It's not the volume of voting that counts, it's the quality of the voting. And so on initiatives, if you have an interest in an initiative, you'll pay attention, you'll become informed. Now, the, the, don't worry about the media. Because in the National Initiative, and that's where you'll see the details of it, I have written a piece of legislation that the process of communication is such, and that's what's wrong with all the initiatives in the states, is that it's not a legislative process. You qualify, everybody throws money at it, and, and, it, and it passes or fails. That's not a way to make laws. It's a deliberative process. You have hearings, you have markups, you have communications, you have advisory votes. That's all laid out in this law. And this law is a little over 5,000 words. You don't need, and it's, and it's written, I'm not an attorney, it's written by a lay person in lay language. And, and, and it's open-ended. And, it's, and it's a, we create an electoral trust independent of representative government. So the people are over here, they do their thing, and they pass their laws, and they can amend the Constitution. It takes two votes to do it. And so if, if you pass an initiative that you don't particularly vote for, and you get hurt by it, i got to tell you, next time an initiative comes by, you'll pay attention a little bit. And so it's a maturation process, and two or three initiatives. Now, let's just stop and think. If you had the power to end the war, would you vote right now on it? 70% of the American people would want to end this war. They don't have the power to do it. If you had an initiative process, that's one you'd vote on. If, if you wanted to change the system of corrupt system of taxation we have right now, you might want to vote on that. You, you want a health care? You might want to vote on that. So there's, you can go through, there's 20 issues. You get beyond 20 issues, you're hard pressed to find national issues you want to vote on. And there's a whole qualification process that, 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 that people, you have to first make a decision, do you want to vote on this issue? If you don't want to vote on it, it doesn't get qualified. And then you get help on this. The, the only time you spend money to get an initiative up is to get it qualified. Once it's qualified, you don't have to spend another suit. It's all paid for just like it is in the Congress of the United States. You pay for whatever the Congress uh, gets in the way of edification. And there's no barriers. Keep in mind, I want to share this with you. This is you got to understand the, how, the, my, how representative government works. When I am about to make a public decision, whether I'm president, I'm a senator, a congressman, a mayor, or a governor, the first thing that comes to mind, this is not pejorative, this is just human nature. How is this going to affect my getting reelected, staying here? I got to pay for my kids. My kids are in college. I got a job. You know, I may not be a millionaire, but I want to stay here. That's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing that comes into my mind is how does this affect the people who put the money up to get me here and to keep me here? That's the second thing that comes to mind. The third thing that comes to my mind is how does it affect my party? Because if my party's in power, I'm in power. Now, I haven't even addressed the public interest in my mind yet. And I know what the public interest is, if I'm intelligent, okay? So now I haven't even talked about my ideology or the fact that I may be a crook, a crook, you know? And so the, the public interest comes in at the third, fourth, or fifth level. That's representative government. But when I ask you as a constituency to vote on your interest, you got no barriers. You will vote on a majoritarian basis of what your enlightened self-interest is. 
and so there's no barriers. But there are insurmountable barriers to the functioning of representative government. That's the reason why it will never work. And that's what was put in place in the Constitution of the United States. Okay? And that's what has to change. And it hasn't been changed since its very inception. So we're in the 21st century where, where, where information moves the speed of light and we're stuck in a format of, go of human governance that, that's over 230 some odd years old. Little wonder we're screwed up in this country and worldwide. Little wonder.